From the California State Senate, this is Senate Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Senate Spotlight, where we discuss legislative priorities, policy, and other related issues with members of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and joining us this time around is State Senator Connie Leva, freshman senator from the 20th Senate District, representing Chino and the rest of the Inland Empire. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, Brian. Good to see you. You are chair of the Democratic Caucus as well, and I know yeah. this is a uh, busy time as we speak for all the caucuses. Yes. Uh, just a couple of weeks left of session. I know it's so much back and forth. I don't see any signs of whiplash yet, but <laughs> how are you doing? How's it going so far? Doing great. Uh, I really love my new job. I'm honored to be the caucus chair. These last few weeks are a little bit crazy, but it feels like we're really getting into the time where we're getting things done. And as I tell people in this job, every day is different, which makes it wonderful. Well, I know every day is different with you with so many topics, and you and your colleagues have just so much going on. And uh, you are also chair, in addition to being chair of the caucus, you're also chair, which is good to know for purposes of this discussion, the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Manufactured Home Communities. That is correct. Known to the rest of us, I guess, as, as mobile homes. Right. And yet that's kind of a, a, a misnomer because all of these manufactured homes, they're not all uh, mobile homes. Uh, they And these mobile homeowners, they have rights, they, they have laws that they, they need and have to abide by. And it's really been a key element of legislative policy for generations, I know that, and and we had talked even before we started taping, uh, when I had been looking at some of this and over the years here working for the legislature, like, really? Mobile home uh, residents need have our lobby? They need yes. representation? Yes, but yes, in fact, they do, and yes. not unlike... I guess brick and mortar homes, they have their own issues. Talk about right. how some of the, the, the similarities and dissimilarities between homeowners and, and mobile home uh, owners and renters. Absolutely. So mobile home owners, there, there's a whole network. You have mobile home owners, you have mobile home folks who rent mobile homes, and you have the park owners and the park managers. So you have a number, number of folks to deal with. I was very excited that the pro tem made me the chair on select committee, on the select committee, because SD20, our district, has 100 132 mobile home parks, which is more mobile home parks than any other district in the state. And where are there, 5,000 in the whole yes, state? Yes, there are right? 5,000 in the whole state. That's exactly right. Good job. Hey, just trying to do a little homework. Here, I but appreciate yeah. that. And just a wide range of how these parks operate. Some are lovely and wonderful, and it, the residents there are doing great. And some are less than lovely, and there's a lot of issues and a lot of problems. So what we're trying to do is bring folks together. Um, the the, the mobile home owners, the park owners, to make sure everyone understands their rights. We've had two uh, uh, hearings so far, one on May 1st and one on July 25th. The one on May 1st, we had about 30 people. The one on the 25th, we had about 150 people. They seem to be growing. There's a huge need, and we give out what we call the Bible. This <laughs> tells everyone what their rights are, and really that that's the issue, is making sure everyone understands what their rights are, how they make sure they get things fixed in their mobile home park, but also making sure the owners know what their responsibilities are and aren't as well. These mobile home uh, owners, uh, what, how, in terms of their demographics, where do they skew? Are they typically older senior folks? Give no, me some detail. No, there is a broad range. So people who live in mobile home parks are just like any of the neighborhoods we may or may not uh, live in. Uh, some of them live in wealthier mobile home parks. Some live in more disadvantaged mobile home parks. And then there's a, a, a wide variety in between. But you have um, young, old, you have uh, male, female, you have lots and lots of families, you have a lot of immigrants in these uh, homes as well, and everyone just needs to know what their rights are. So that, that way they're being treated the way they should be treated. We, we found some issues. What are some of the issues? Tell me, what so are some one, of the contentious issues? One of the biggest issues is um, me, the metering and utilities. Uh, many times each mobile home is not separately metered, so there's one meter and then the park owner will just divide the bill up and give you a bill, me a bill, and everyone else a bill. So it's not necessarily what Connie Leva used or what Brian used. It is an average. Uh, and the mobile homeowners don't feel like they're being treated fairly in that way. Some of the issues come down to sanitation. And uh, some of the parks need some help there. We, we have reached out to those owners where we've seen problems. And to their credit, they are fixing those problems. But I think the biggest issue is people just didn't know their rights. And, and we've had wonderful support from the um, Mobile Home Owners Association. They've come in. They 
want to partner, make sure the right thing is happening. But um, we have a lot of work to do because mm -hmm. there are a number of issues, but we'll get, we'll get there. And I guess rent control is another issue? Rent control is a big issue. It's come up at every meeting, and a lot of the residents would like to see a statewide rent control policy. In what I'm learning, that might not be in their best interest. It's really better if they have a local ordinance um, that controls their rent. Uh, what I hope to help them is to empower them to go to their city council and institute some sort of a, a rent control. I think the issue is, is these folks don't know how to do it themselves, mm -hmm. so they're thinking that doing it statewide would be best. Hopefully we can empower them and they can go to their city councils and get their rent under control. And one of the other issues I know is the park managers and the relationship between the park managers and the resident. When you talk about knowing the rights, there yes. are some, some park managers out there who uh, they have rules and regulations that they don't necessarily follow, yes. may be unscrupulously. Yes. Tell me about some of that dynamic. So some parks don't even have park managers, which makes it even more uh, a bigger problem because then people are kind of just doing whatever they want to do. But where there are park managers, a a lot of them, they, there's no training. They don't get trained on how to be a park manager and what the laws are, what the issues are, what they can do, what they can't do. So that's something that we're working on. And when there aren't trained managers, we do get to some uh, unscrupulous activities and we're trying to help curtail that. I think training would be very helpful for these folks. Most, most people want to do the right thing. And mobile homeowners, of course, are at the mercy of That's the economic exactly downturns right. as our brick and mortar home owners and oftentimes are at the mercy of losing their homes over financial dis difficulties as exactly much as anyone right. else. That's You've exactly authored right. a bill here this session that protects in particular senior, blind, and disabled residents yes. in mobile home parks from losing their homes if and when they encounter financial difficulties. Tell us about SB 477. So it's a tax deferment. So if I am a, a disabled person, if I'm a senior, maybe I've come on hard times and I can't pay the taxes, those taxes could then be deferred until frankly I pass and then the state can collect the taxes and the mobile home park could sell could sell the uh, the, the actual trailer so uh, yes I'm hopeful this is something that was reinstituted a couple years ago for actual homeowners mm -hmm. but mobile homes were left out so we just want them to be included back in the mix what's the status of the bill right now as we speak that is a great question okay. I should know that <laughs> uh, I, I believe it's oh it's you know what I know exactly where it is it's in assembly appropriations it's on suspense so I'm hoping it will be released from suspense on Thursday. <laughs> well, the Western, the Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association was just looking at some of the background. They are concerned that the deferral of taxes here on this will end up exceeding the value of the home yes. and the park owner will be saddled with a home that has a negative equity. These, some of these communities have mobile homes with 100% equity that were abandoned during the recent economic downturn and they had little resale value and then the park uh, owners had to, to deal with the expense of that. They would like to see mobile homes valued at a minimum $10,000 to be eligible for this program and this bill. What do you say to all of that uh, opposition? Well, we have had conversations, and I said I, I understand their concern. I really do. But that is a very, that's a small percentage of people, that's a small percentage of mobile homes that would be in that situation where they're less than, they would be sold for less than what they could get for them. We've got to look at the 95% of people that this would really help, not the 5% where there will be a problem. So I understand their concern, but I think that they can find a way around it. <laughs> there have been it's 30 plus years now that there has been some sort of mobile home committee or representation here in the legislature. How does the, the, the arc of justice, if you will, for mobile home uh, park, uh, the, the mobile home owners, uh, how, how have things changed? How much better they are than they were, say, 30 years ago? You know, I hate to say it, but I think in some cases, I think it's worse. I think the downturn in the economy um, forced a lot of folks into uh, mobile home parks, uh, which is fine, but I, I really, just from the parks that I've toured, I've seen a lot of issues in our, our district, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done to make sure these can be beautiful communities, and these mm -hmm. can be communities where people can raise their family. Another issue that we found is there isn't always a common space for children to play, and in every park that I've visited, there there are families, and you kids have got to have a place to play, and because just the way mobile homes are set up, there isn't a lot of yard, so there needs to be a common area for the children to play. So I think that we have a lot of work to do in this area, but I'm 
I'm extremely hopeful that we can do it and just make it a great place for everybody to live. Well, it's really the essence of local politics, Absolutely. isn't it? Because even though there's there's 5,000 of these uh, these mobile homeowners across the country, or across the state in particular, I, I mean, it's to a person, yeah. to a community, in your community, these yes. issues are very important. Yes, and the people that live in mobile home parks are really a very tight-knit community because they live much closer than even we do on the blocks. Uh, if you live in a regular um, single-family home, these folks are much closer, so they tend to be a very close-knit community. All right, from mobile homes to minimum wage, yes. you are the principal co-author of SB3, which would uh, essentially raise, uh, through a certain amount of time and process, our minimum wage here in California to $13 by the year of 2017. You've been working on this, obviously, since the first of the year, co-authoring with uh, Senator Leno. Uh, give us the details and the status of this and what this is going to mean to uh, California workers. Absolutely. So I would first say it's unfortunate that we're in a position where the legislature has to do something on wages. If companies were a little more responsible and made sure there were good jobs in our communities, we wouldn't have to be worrying about this. The, the economy has rebounded with primarily retail jobs, and retail jobs, unless they're union jobs, tend to be not very good jobs. So raising the minimum wage, the biggest thing about SB3 is that in 2017, it would go to $13 an hour, but then in 2019, it is indexed to minimum wage. Right. Because whatever number we pick for minimum wage, it, it, it automatically becomes stagnant the, the next day. So this way, it would actually increase with, the, uh, with, the, with inflation and give people who earn minimum wage more buying power. So uh, the status of the bill, it is over in the assembly we are hoping it gets out of the assembly and uh, onto the governor's desk and very hopeful that the governor will sign that. And obviously it affects uh, people, communities of color and yes. women in particular, yes. most definitely. So 88% of people who earn minimum wage right now are over the age of 20. I think a lot of people, the misconception is people who earn minimum wage are in high school, they're in college, just trying to make a couple extra bucks. And it really hasn't been that way for a very long time. If we look at most retail workers, fast food workers, um, they're, they're an older population and unfortunately too many of them are trying to support themselves and their family on that wage. So 88% so are over 20 20 and 55 percent of those folks are women. So it absolutely affects women more than it does men. I know you've heard all of the job killer arguments. Yes. And, and we've, that's that's sort of not, a, not an unusual argument. But there are economists yes. who are saying that there is still a nexus between a higher minimum wage and job loss. So right. is there a point where a uh, job loss exceeds a benefit to workers, particularly here in California? You know, I think that increasing the minimum wage is going to be hard on some of our smaller industries, smaller businesses. But in the long run, I think of like the, the restaurant association. Uh, restaurants, people don't go out to eat when they don't have money. And I remember during the Great Recession, uh, folks that I knew who managed restaurants and managed restaurant change said, you know, you represent grocery store workers. That's great because people still have to eat, they'll go to the grocery store. But when people don't have money, they don't go out to eat. So in the long run, when people make more, they spend more. That's just a fact. So there may be some short-term losses, but it will be a long-term gain for everyone. Well, you mentioned restaurants. It's interesting. I was reading just this week in the New York Times, uh, there's a restaurants in Seattle, where I guess the first stage of a $15 oh, right. dollar an hour minimum wage it took effect in April. The restaurants, restaurateurs are raising prices, some by 21%, and they're ending tipping. Okay. And so by doing this, they're thinking, and I'm simplifying it yes. here, but their they're thinking is that they can then afford a minimum wage increase. Other cities, I guess, even New York is considering doing this. Are employees being hurt in that case in an effort to help them with a higher minimum wage? Well, I would say that's very unfortunate if they're limiting tipping because that is part of that industry and that's part of how those folks, because even, even $15 an hour isn't always a livable wage. That doesn't always make, an, people don't always make enough to pay their bills. Uh, tipping is a part of it. Uh, I would say that. But I think that raising prices, I'll pay a couple cents more. I'll pay a little bit more to make sure that the person who is serving me can feed their family, can pay their rent. A study a number of years ago was done that if Walmart increased its um, wages to $12 an hour, it would cost each person who shopped there 30 cents more per trip. I'd be happy, I don't shop at Walmart, but I would be happy to pay 30 cents more anywhere so that a worker can make a livable wage. And I think most people would feel that way too. 
Here's another notion for you on this issue. Yes. There was a blogger earlier this year, Matt Walsh. He's the Absolute Truths blogger. And this was at the time when the McDonald's workers were uh, protesting for a higher wage. And he kind of took them to task. He says, you know what? This higher wage is $15 an hour. That's what we pay biologists. That's what we pay auto mechanics and roofers and bank tellers. You know, that may sound like fun to get $15 an hour, but is it fair? Right. And can we take a 17-year-old McDonald's worker, and they're not all 17. That them is them correct. Are a lot older. Yes. And you give them the salary like law enforcement or or roofers or teachers uh, and that things are going to just go on as normal and it's like that should yeah. be something you should aspire to and yeah. settle for what you have less. Yeah. What do you think of that notion? I love that uh, his, his tagline is the absolute truth. Well maybe it's mostly the truth. So if we are paying our biologists and our mechanics $15 an hour, we are doing something wrong. But I would say that our society has changed and we have evolved in less of a manufacturing society into more of a service oriented society and a retail society. So we've got to change these jobs as the industry is changing. Otherwise, we are going to continue to see the wage gap grow. The very rich, and the very poor, and there will be no middle class. So we have an obligation to change as this as our society changes. Thank you for everything you're doing for California society. Obviously, so much to talk about, so little time. Yes. But thank you for coming in. We will do this again sooner than later. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. My pleasure. Connie Leva, our senator from the 20th Senate District here in California. And that is it for this edition of Senate Spotlight. Please join us next time around as we discuss important legislative issues and policies with the newsmakers and newsbreakers of California and the California State Senate. From the State Capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Senate Spotlight.